Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is such an impressive work of animation. It's ranking up there among the best Spider-Man stories because it actually gets what it's like to read a Spider-Man comic book and translate all that so beautifully to screen. Like nothing against emo Peter, tall Peter, or Peter third time's a charm, but there's so much more to Spider-Man comics, and a story that celebrates the full Spider-Man history with some amazing visual storytelling really just nailed what we love about the character. So I'm gonna break down this movie scene by scene to point out all of the cool details that you might have overlooked looked, hidden animation jokes and easter eggs, but also subtle creative choices made by the filmmakers to make Into the Spider-Verse work so well. Spoiler warning if you haven't seen the movie yet, and let's get started. Okay, the opening frames of this movie already set it apart from every other Spider-Man movie that we've seen, and really every animated movie that we've seen before. The studio logos are depicted with these Ben Day dots, which appear actually throughout every frame of the movie. Filmmakers of Into the Spider-Verse had a difficult task before them, because the Spider-Man character had already been rebooted so many times on film. And they wanted this one to feel distinct. Their concept was for it to feel like a living painting, as if you were walking into an actual comic book. So you see all these comic book aesthetics throughout the movie. The bidet dots, along with hatching lines, and both of these are used by older comic books to shade images without having to spend so much ink. And of course you see split screen panels, and action words, thought panels, and talking bubbles. But beyond these visuals, the filmmakers also had to rebuild a whole new style of animation that you only really perceive on a subconscious level. So standard film is shot on 24 frames per second, and modern animated films follow this model, with a movement of like a Pixar movie blending pretty smoothly because every second is made up of 24 individual still images. But for Into the Spider-Verse, the animators had to animate in twos. That means doubling each frame so that you essentially get 12 frames per second. That was how traditional old school animation was done. So they reconstructed that style to give this movie a certain crispness to the movement. From character's hair or clothing, making things look almost, in their words, crunchy and sharp, so that you really have impact with an image. It burns into your psyche. That is why when you watch this movie, the art of each frame really stands out. Kind of like when you read a comic book. Each moment is so punctuated. By the way, Sony is actually trying to patent this animation technology. This whole comic book motif is also the reason for this stamp in the opening frames. Approved by the Comic Books Code Authority. The Comic Books Code Authority was a set of guidelines for comic books in the 50s to assure parents that the comic books wouldn't turn their kids into sexual deviants or criminals or communists. <laughs> nice try, fascists. These guidelines forbid creating sympathy for the criminal, saying crime shouldn't be glamorous, but rather a sordid and unpleasant activity, and that criminals should be shown being punished for their actions. And you know, this stamp isn't just a joke. Into the Spider-Verse actually abides by these rules. Villains like Kingpin and Aaron Davis might be shown some sympathy in that I guess their behavior is motivated by something deeper than simple, pure evil. But you know, their criminality doesn't really look fun. They suffer a lot. No kid's gonna wanna emulate them or dress up for them as Halloween. Or if you're me, any time of the year. In the opening titles, we also see the recurring number of 42. Shows up on a spider, and on the lottery ball for Miles being selected for his school. Later it appears as cluttered numbers from a shattered street address sign. 42 is actually the number of the radioactive spider that bites Miles in the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. It was the 42nd test of this spider that actually worked. In this movie, the number 42 appears over and over kind of to haunt Miles whenever his new Spider-Man powers burden him, kind of like a curse. And through all this, we hear the voice of Spider-Man, the Peter Parker of this Ultimate Universe. He's voiced by Chris Pine, and he says, all right, let's do do this one last time, which is repeated over and over again by every new Spider-Man that we meet. It's of course a nod to the endless numbers of reboots and reintroductions of Spidey in movies over the years. A Spider-Man comic book thunks down in front of us on the table, and on the cover you can see the signature of someone named M. Vignali. Marcelo Vignali is a longtime film animator and artist who worked on this movie, but every time we see a new Spider-Man introduced, the comic book cover changes to credit the comic book artists who created those characters. So like at the end of the film, when we get introduced to Miles officially, Comic book artists Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pacelli are on the cover. And when we meet Spider-Gwen, it's Jason Latour and Robbie Rodriguez. For Spider-Man Noir, it's David Hine, Fabrice Spolsky, and Carmine DiGia Dimencio. And for Penny Parker, it's Gerard Way and Jake Wyatt. Now, as I said, this first Spider-Man universe is the one from the Ultimate Comics. This is Earth-1610. It's an alternate dimension from our normal default universe, Earth-616. That's why a lot of the products have alternate reality spins on them. Like there's Red X instead of FedEx, P 
PDNY instead of NYPD, Coca Soda instead of RC Cola. <laughs> yep, that's the sound of 100 commenters who don't get the jokes correct to me saying, uh, it's Coke, obviously. In the Ultimate Comics, Peter Parker actually dies and Miles Morales takes over. And this Peter also has blonde hair, which could be a nod to the Ben Riley Spider Man from the Clone Saga. Peter's introduction references several moments from the Sam Raimi Spider Man trilogy with Tobey Maguire. There was the train rescue from Spider Man 2, the upside down MJ kiss from the first one, the car flying through the window in Spider-Man 2, and of course the cringy pointing and dancing from Spider-Man 3. The cover of The Amazing Spider-Man 186 shows up, but here the title has actually been changed to True Life Tales. There's also a girl eating Spidey O's cereal, perhaps a nod to the real Spider-Man cereal from the 90s that was promoted with the Spider-Man animated series. We also see a Spider-Man popsicle, which is also a real thing, and a brief shot from the 60s Spider-Man animated series that gets a big shout out in the post credit scene. And then the Spider-Man Christmas album includes titles like Spidey it's cold outside, swinging around the mistletoe, silent night you're welcome, joy to the world that I just saved, Spidey the snowman, it's beginning to look a lot like a non-denominational holiday, and Ave Maria. Huh, no joke on that one? That's no pun. <laughs> Next we meet the hero of this movie, Miles Morales, voiced by Shamik Moore. Now he's singing the song Sunflower, it's a song written specifically for this movie by Post Malone. He actually makes a cameo later in this movie as a Brooklyn bystander. Now Miles' background is quite different from Peter Parker's. Miles lives in Brooklyn, not Queens, and he still has his parents. He's a son of a black father and a Puerto Rican mother. Now his father, Jefferson Davis, is voiced by Brian Tyree Henry. He's a cop with a PDNY and look closely at his police cruiser. It has a license plate reading RFD 960. It's actually the same tag number for the car that the detectives drive in the show Law and & Order. And Miles' dad misquotes the famous Uncle Ben quote saying, with great ability comes great accountability. The quote actually comes up a couple times throughout the movie. Now Miles attends the Brooklyn Visions Academy and in his English class, he's assigned Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, which actually sets up another running theme in the movie. Like the character Pip in Great Expectations, Miles struggles to live up to the expectations of this new elite society that he wants to join. Gwen Stacy is kind of this movie's parallel to Estella, who is Pip's romantic aspiration. But as we'll see throughout this movie, Miles defies these great expectations, with his answer to his book report being a graffiti illustration of the word expectations, foreshadowing his new spray painted design on his suit at the end of the movie, as Miles makes his literal mark on the world. But there's a very interesting detail hidden in this physics class. They watch a video from the Alchemax Corporation featuring the head scientist, Olivia. Now we later learn that her name is actually Olivia Octavius, this movie's version of the villain Doc Ock. But this early moment foreshadows the later reveal. Notice how Miles stands directly in front of her last name, hinting that she's someone important. Also, the number eight shows up a ton around Olivia. And right away here, you can see that number in her character design. Her glasses frames are octagons. Later, Miles ditches his homework to hang out with his uncle Aaron, voiced by Mahershala Ali. He moonlights as the villain, the Prowler. And look closely at the art in his apartment and his clothes. They all feature some large predator cats. Actually, I think the painting above the couch says the word Prowler, if you look closely at those skewed letters. Now, over in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Donald Glover plays the live action version of Aaron Davis. I don't want those weapons in this neighborhood. I got a nephew who live here. Glover actually voiced Miles Morales in the animated series. Now, Miles' visit with his uncle is scored by Biggie's Hypnotize. Biggie was famously a Brooklyn rapper. So this music here is another thing that identifies this Spider-Man as a uniquely Brooklyn one. And as Miles and Aaron tag Miles' expectations design on the wall, Miles gets bitten by the Alchemax 42 spider, hilariously swatting it off. He gets his Spider-Man powers, he clutches his way through school. I actually love how the school security guard who chases Miles is listening to the Spider-Man Christmas album that we saw earlier, and this is actually Chris Pine himself doing the vocals of the Jingle Bells parody. You actually hear a full version of the song in the end credits. And as Miles hangs on the side of the school building, fun little joke with the hang in there kitty motivational poster. And when Miles ends up in his dorm room, the comic book that lands on his face is another real Spider-Man comic book cover, Amazing Fantasy number 15. Miles panics and looks through his phone contacts, and if you look closely, he scrolls past the names of B. Bendis and Sarah Pacelli. Those are shout outs to the creators of the Miles Morales character in the Ultimate Comics. And and Miles witnesses Spider-Man locked in battle with Green Goblin. He's actually the monstrous Ultimate Comics version of the villain. In those comics, Green Goblin is the one who kills Peter Parker, not Kingpin. Prowler also shows up to fight Spidey, and later Spider-Man villain Tombstone shows up as part of Kingpin's henchman team. Kingpin, Wilson Fisk, oversees this Collider test run, and he's voiced by Liev Schreiber. I like how this movie stays true to Kingpin's gargantuan size from the comics. I guess there's only so much you can do with forced perspective on Vincent D'Onofrio and Michael Clark Duncan. Now, when the Collider turns on, 
notice how the interdimensional particles take the shape of Bendei ink dots. It's as if this device is tearing the fabric of these different comic book universes and causing the ink from the pages to spill onto each other. And on a screen beside Kingpin, you see the exact dimensions that are being linked. The one in the center, their universe, is E1610, while the others show E616, E13, E90412, E14513, and E8311. Those are all the exact Marvel Universe numbers for, respectively, Miles Morales, Peter Parker, Spider-Gwen, Spider-Man Noir, Penny Parker, and Peter Porker. And when Goblin holds Peter into the particle beam, Peter enters this trippy, webby, interdimensional space. Actually, all the spider people are shown getting sucked into this realm as they're crossing over to another dimension. This could be the web of life and destiny from the comics. That's the visual construct showing the cosmic connection between all the different parts of the Spider-Man multiverse. And after Kingpin kills Peter, Miles runs off and watches the world mourn the death of Spider-Man. Now, these various shots of Times Square are filled with Easter eggs and animation details. There's a movie billboard for From Dusk Till Sean, which is a nod to the movie Shaun of the Dead. From Dusk Till Sean was actually Edgar Wright's title idea for a Shaun of the Dead sequel, with vampires like from Dusk Till Dawn. There's another movie poster for a Seth Rogen comedy called Hold Your Horses, and a show called Clone College, which is a fictional spin-off of the animated series Clone High, created by Spider-Verse producers Phil Lord and Chris Miller. There's also an ad for a Broadway show called Hi Hello, a nod to Oh Hello from the Broadway show from Nick Kroll and John Mulaney. John Mulaney, of course, voices Peter Porker. And it looks like in Earth 1610, New York's baseball team is the New York Red Sox, and according to one of the signs Blake Griffin plays for them. Sure. And there's a sign for a restaurant called Planet Inglewood. Of course, it's been on Planet Hollywood. There are also signs for Bendis. That's another shout out to Brian Bendis. And a sign for Romita Ramen. Probably a nod to Spider-Man artist John Romita Sr. Now, later shows of Times Square, you can see Red Man Group, a parody of the Blue Man Group, and Kissland, which looks like an alternate version of the Weekend Starboy album cover. There are also a bunch of signs for like the Golden Boys, Steph Curry, and some all-female movies movie called Baby Shower, which kind of looks like a nod to Bridesmaids, and a sign for a Snapchat app called Peekaboo, which is honestly such a better name than Snapchat. Now this whole morning sequence leads to an emotional cameo by an animated version of Stan Lee, who runs a Spider-Man collectible shop where Miles buys a costume. He says about Spider-Man, I'm really gonna miss him, basically voicing all of our thoughts about Stan Lee. Miles' self-training failure leads him to Peter's grave, where he meets Earth-616 Spider-Man, Peter B. Parker, voiced by Jake Johnson. He says in his introductory montage that he has been at it for 22 years, compared to Chris Pine Peter Parker, who said he'd been at it for 10. Now, this means that that Peter Parker was 26 when he died, and that this chubby Peter B. Parker has lived the age of 38. Now, Peter B.'s intro also shows them fighting alternate versions of the villain Scorpion, Doc Ock, and the Lizard. He also blows all of his money trying to open a TGI Spidey's restaurant, and he says that he broke his back at one point, which could be a joke about Peter Parker hurting his back in that scene in Spider-Man 2. My back! Oh, my back! By the way, that was apparently a joke about how Tobey Maguire held out on production for Spider-Man 2 because he injured his back while shooting the movie Seabiscuit, and he was able to convince Sony to pay him way more money to do Spider-Man 2. After that amazing chase scene that we saw in the post credit scene of Venom, Peter and Miles get to know each other, and they head to the Alchemax lab in Hudson Valley. Now, Alchemax is kind of one of these evil science-y corporations. It showed up first in the Spider-Man 2099 comics, but it was later introduced in a present-day form in the Ultimate comics. Now, here we see even more clues about the scientist Olivia, voiced by Katherine Hahn, and how she's secretly Doc Ock. Look at all the ceiling light fixtures. They're all octagonal, along with various octagon shapes throughout the lab. And a true smoking gun, you can see a spare Doc Ock claw laying on the work table. Liv's notebook also contains the note X minus eight, and later the missing number of the password that Peter signals to Miles is an eight. Now we learned from this sequence that Miles has the power of invisibility, which along with that electric charge thing that we see later, these are all new powers that the ultimate Spider-Man gave in those comics. A little detail that I loved as Peter and Miles escape. When Miles chucks the bagel that Peter stole back in the kitchen, hits one of the scientists firing on him with a little bagel action word. Now these two are saved by Spider Gwen, Gwen Stacy. Her montage shows her drumming in the comics. Gwen Stacy plays in the band called Mary Janes, and she's seen fighting the lizard who transforms back into a scaly man and dies, and she says, I couldn't save my best friend. This is a reference to how in those comics, Gwen Stacy Spider-Man faces off against a Peter Parker who turns him to the villain, the 
lizard. And right before she gets sucked out of her dimension, you can actually see a Doc Ock claw reaching out to try to grab her. So you can think of it this way, by defeating Doc Ock in this reality, Spider-Gwen finally finishes that battle. Next, we learn why Kingpin is experimenting with alternate dimensions to begin with. A flashback shows his ex-wife, Vanessa Fisk, and his son, Richard Fisk. These are both part of the Kingpin's backstory in the comics. We also saw Vanessa Fisk show up in the Daredevil series. The team heads to Queens, to the home of Aunt May. She's voiced in this movie by Lily Tomlin. She brings them down into Ultimate Peter's high-tech spider cave, which also has a ton of references. There's a Spider-Man skateboard, Spider-Man action figures, a Spider-Mobile that actually originated from a run of Spider-Man comics in the 70s that was focused on selling toys. And of course, there are a ton of Spider-Man suits. Here are the ones I spotted and was able to recognize. There's the Iron Spider suit from the Marvel Civil War comics that has the gold lining that was meant to identify Peter as part of Team Iron Man. To the left of that is the Spider Armor MK2, which Peter actually designed to be bulletproof for a brief period when he lost his Spidey sense and couldn't dodge bullets. And next to that, I think I think kind of looks like the Secret Wars suit. Remember that had the white spider logo when the Venom symbiote briefly attached to Spider-Man? Then there's the big time stealth suit, which Peter makes in response to the Spider Slayer program. And beside that is the suit with the cape that Miles points out to Peter. That looks like the cape that Spider-Man wore in the Marvel Comics What If series, issue 19. That's when Spider-Man became a TV star. There's also what looks like the Secret Wars stealth suit. And at one point in the background, you can definitely see the white logo of the suit from the recent Spider-Man PS4 game. Okay, next, Ant-Man. May introduces the full team, including three other spider people. First, there's Spider-Man Noir from Earth 90214. He comes from a darker, crime-ridden 1930s world, and he uses guns, he kills people. He's voiced by Nicolas Cage. Then there's Penny Parker from Earth 14512. She actually gets adopted by Uncle Ben and Aunt May, and she pilots this mech spider robot with the help of a spider she's kind of telekinetically connected to. She's voiced by Kimiko Glenn. And then, of course, there's Peter Porker, Spider-Ham from Earth 8311. He was actually a spider bitten by a radioactive pig, which turned him into a pig with the abilities of the spider. He's voiced by comedian John Mulaney. Now, in addition to these new intro montages, notice how the animation style changes for each new character. Like, Noir has a monochromatic, Frank Miller Sin City style aesthetic. Penny Parker has a really bright Sailor Moon anime style. And Peter Porker is designed in the style of Warner Brothers Looney Tunes characters. He moves a lot like Porky Pig in Space Jam. And as they examine Kingpin's crime operation, another Marvel villain shows up. This is the villain Hammerhead. It's got a big, dumb blockhead. He actually doesn't show up in the movie at all. Instead, Scorpion ends up joining the villain team later on. Now, when Miles runs off, his father runs through his phone contacts, trying to find him, and a bunch of names show up as Easter eggs. D. Cowan, probably Dennis Cowan, longtime comic book artist. C. McKenna, I'm thinking that's Chris McKenna. He's a screenwriter and friend of Lord and Miller. He worked on the Lego Batman movie and Ant-Man the Wasp and Homecoming and Far From Home. T. McFarlane, probably for Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man artist and co-creator of Image Comics. And at the end, you can see Steve Ditko listed. He, along with Stan Lee, was one of these major comics pioneers. He co-created the Spider-Man character and a bunch of other characters, and he passed away earlier this year. That's why that post-credit moment honored both Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. After Kingpin's crew attacks Aunt May's house and Kingpin murders Uncle Aaron, the other spider people find Miles in his dorm room. In this scene, you can see that he has a Chance the Rapper poster for the mixtape coloring book. Miles' roommate walks in on them, and we never really hear anything from this guy. I'm thinking this could be a version of Gonke Lee from the Ultimate Comics. The character of Ned Leeds in Spider-Man Homecoming basically took everything from that character. And he's reading an Imagine That comic. That seems like a nod to the What If series. Now later, Miles escapes the webbing that Peter puts him in by accessing his electric pulse power, and he suits up with his new badass black and red suit. Actually, a detail I really liked here, notice how when Miles takes his big leap of faith and he swings back up, his woo cheer follows up as letters. And that contrasts the earlier moment of his failed jump. Remember when his terrified ah followed him down. And as he swings into action, Miles passes a neon sign reading Perry Joe. It's actually a nod to the guitarist Joe Perry from Aerosmith. I just learned this, he composed the opening music for the 90s Spider-Man animated series, as well as the awesome X-Men animated series music. And this brings us to the epic climax of this movie. It's insane, it's beautiful. There's random objects floating in a three-dimensional space as the dimensions crash on top of each other. It makes for a perfect melee setting for a group of spider things looking for surfaces to swing from. And among all this chaos, you can actually see some familiar landmarks surrounding Kingpin. There's a red water tower and Brooklyn Bridge. These could be nods to the red-soaked imagery from the opening credits of the Netflix Daredevil show, in which, of course, Wilson Fisk was the main antagonist. In the end, Miles defeats Kingpin by using his Uncle Aaron's classic move, the hand on the shoulder, hey. 
This is an example of some really good screenwriting. Miles is using the wisdom gained from his uncle to avenge his uncle and defeat his uncle's killer. Full circle. Star Wars actually pulled off the same device, right? Like Darth Vader kills Obi-Wan Kenobi, and later Luke uses Obi-Wan's wisdom echoing in his head, gained from their past lessons, to deliver the final blow against Vader. And as the various dimensions crash in on each other, the filmmakers include an interesting shot of uh, interdimensional webbing flying past us. And notice how they hold on it for a few seconds longer than you probably would. To me, this makes the shot seem like a possible homage to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Specifically that one super colorful, psychedelic, long take point of view shot as we soared through dimensions. And then the final sequence of this movie bookends the story with the introduction of Miles Morales. He's going through all the same steps of his counterparts every time we got to meet them. And now he takes over as a star of this corner of the Spider-Verse. Now this movie did have a post credit scene that introduced Spider-Man 2099 to us. I actually go into all the details of that in another video, go check it out. But for now, question for you guys, how does this Spider-Man film rank up against the other Spider-Man movies that you've seen? Like don't get me wrong, I love Tom Holland's reboot in Civil War and in Homecoming. And Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 is for me one of my all time favorite superhero movies, period. But I don't know, when I see the look and the design of this into the Spider-Verse and just the joy of all the Spider-Man people interacting with each other? I don't know, don't yell at me, but this might be my favorite Spider-Man movie ever. Comment down below with your favorite cinematic Spider-Man and follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EA Voss and subscribe to New Rockstars for Spider everything. You know, one of these days you're gonna go look at the Spider-Man suit that I'm always wearing underneath these clothes. That's why you gotta subscribe and you gotta watch everything. Oh shoot, I think it, I gotta get a, oh, Dang it, he said no refunds. <laughs>